Hello, welcome. So in a previous video, we did kind of an overview of uh, the closed economy model. So that's like the classical uh, long run economy model, sometimes the aggregate model. Uh, we did like this long overview, talking about the underpinnings, uh, bringing it all together into this market of loanable funds and then the uh, uh, market for goods and services, aggregate market for goods and services. Um, and now we're going through some shocks to the economy. So um, the shocks that we're going to do now is an increase in investment demand. Uh, we're going to see the effect of that on the real interest rate and investment. Oh, uh, so yeah, if you want to see that overview video, have a look at the video description. I'll also link to other examples as well. Okay, let's get started. So first off, where might a change of investment demand come from? Um, well, for example, technological innovation. Uh, suppose some technology comes along that makes firms more productive. Um, so computer or the internet, in order for firms to take advantage of those uh, improvements in IT, they need to invest in capital. They need to buy the computers, they need to buy the mainframes, the people uh, need to you know, be trained in all that sort of thing. So they, they need to borrow money uh, in order to invest in that improved technology. Uh, another way would be uh, if, if government incentivized investment by changing this tax structure in some way. So these, these are things that could increase investment demand. Um, and then within this model, how, do, how does that fit in? So uh, an increase in investment demand would, in, would uh, shift out the investment demand curve. So that's shifting out our red line here for investment demand. This outward shift in investment demand is saying that, um, you know, at every real interest rate, uh, the quantity of investment that firms demand uh, in order to borrow that investment and spend it on capital goods is increasing. So uh, with this outward shift in investment demand, uh, we have a new equilibrium real interest rate. Uh, and the equilibrium real interest rate is the rate such that the quantity supplied, um, which is set by this national savings, is going to be equal to uh, quantity demanded, our new uh, investment demand curve. Also note, so I added these little subscripts, so I sub 1 and I sub 2, just to indicate the change, so the starting point and the, the ending point. Um, and then the new real interest rate is this R sub 2 here. So first off, an increase in investment demand um, implies that the investment curve shifts out. And then, um, so we see that the real interest rate increases. from R1 to R2. Um, and then in this simple setup, you know, given the assumptions of the model, national savings is still fixed. So national savings is just a function of output Y, which we have fixed because there's fixed capital and labor, um, and uh, fixed consumption because consumption is just a function of uh, disposable income and then fixed government spending. None of those things changed uh, and they're all fixed so we have this like straight vertical line. So investment hasn't changed at all but the real interest rate changed. But it's also possible that you could have a savings, supply of savings that's um, you know not a kind of a fixed amount. So here we set it up so that the savings rate, the savings schedule, now responds to changes in the real exchange rate. Basically saying that if the real exchange rate is really high, then consumers are going to adjust their consumption so that they have more savings and savings is uh, higher. While if the real interest rate is super low, then consumers uh, won't produce quite as much savings for this, this market for loanable funds. So in this situation, uh, you once again have the increase in the real exchange rate. So the real exchange rate run up went up from uh, R1 to R2 here. But then we also have an increase in um, investment. So we started off at this equilibrium point, and now we're going to this new equilibrium point. So investment has moved from I1 to I2. So just by kind of tweaking the assumptions a little bit, you can have a, both the increase uh, in the real interest rate going from R1 to R2, and then also the increase in the investment rate going from I1 to I2. So yeah, that's the effect of an increase in investment demand. Uh, we might also have a decrease in investment demand, uh, and that would look like the following. 
So if we go back to our initial kind of a savings schedule here, where savings is fixed, if you have an increase in investment demand, that means we have a new investment demand curve. Uh, let's say something like this. So it shifted inwards. So we're going to have a new investment rate, R2. Uh, the investment rate is equal to the equilibrium for savings and the new investment demand curve. So if investment demand decreases, we have we shift the investment curve inward and we have our new equilibrium. So one conclusion we have is uh, the real interest rate goes down. Um, and then similar to the previous version where we had an increase in investment demand, uh, this saving schedule doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line had we shifted it something like this so now savings is a function of the real interest rate if this is the situation given the decrease in investment demand you're going to have a decrease in the real interest rate just like we had before but you're also going to have a decrease in investment as well so before investment was at this level, at the initial intersection of uh, the, the supply of loanable funds and the demand of loanable funds at this I sub 1, and now we have at this new equilibrium over here at the new intersection uh, labeled I sub 2. So if we allow our savings schedule to be a function of the real interest rate, you have a, a, in, a decrease in investment demand leads to a decrease in the real interest rate and a decrease in investment demand too. So that was a, a little fast, but uh, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, thanks and have a good day. Bye.